<laughs> Good evening. I am Petra Wright. I am the gallery director of Gloria Delson Contemporary Arts, also known as GDCA Gallery. Tonight, we are delighted to welcome you to a virtual closing reception of our two beautiful June exhibitions, our group show Essence and our solo exhibit, Cynthia Ann Swan, Deja Vu. Both exhibits are on display through June 30th. So we are in the final few days and the final weekend. So please, if you haven't had a chance, come on by, come and see these beautiful, beautiful works in person. All of the works are for sale, except for the ones that are already sold. And you'll notice there's quite a few of them. <laughs> We're very proud of our artists. Um, but if you see something that grabs you, please don't be shy, reach out. Um, you can also go to our website, uh, gdcagallery.com. And under um, current exhibition, if you scroll past the installation shots, you will reach a catalog listing each artist and all of their artworks on display with their mediums and their prices. So um, you can always go there as an immediate reference and then I'm as far away as the phone. Mm. So now we are going to begin by taking you through a slideshow presentation. And I'm going to remind all of my panelists um, to please mute your audio so that um, there is no feedback until uh, you're called upon to speak. Thanks, guys. Um, so we're going to take you through a slideshow presentation. We're going to be moving primarily front to back through the gallery with one exception um, into each of the artist sections, at which points the artists will join us to speak about their work. Uh, if you have any questions for any of the artists, we are going to have a Q&A at the end. So uh, please feel free to type your questions to the artists into the chat window. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, there is a chat window, not the Q&A, the chat window. Type your questions in there and at the end of the presentation, we will go over them and field them to the artists that you um, would like to speak to. So please stick around. And that's it. So here we go. We're going to get started. Um, all right. Petra is going to share her screen. Everybody hold your breath. Here we go. Where is it? Share screen. Here we go. So far, so good. All righty. Um, so this is, we're going to begin with our group show, Essence. Um, so sorry, I have lost some of my papers. All right. Um, participating artists, as you see, are Adria Becker, Suzanne Belcher, Richard Bell, Michele Castagnetti, Terry Dryden, Suki Kuss, Bill Sherwood, and Linda Stelling, and of course, Cynthia Ann Swan. Essence celebrates eight colorful, expressive and self-reflective voices in the mediums in painting of in mediums of painting, mixed media and collage. To channel and release life force, vitality and joy, one must first harness and cultivate its essence. Art is an immediate and lasting conduit to this pursuit. In thinking about essence, what is it really? What are its components? It occurs to me, it is the details. Who we are is revealed in the details. The details of what we choose to say and what is left unspoken. It's not in the brick and mortar of our souls, but in the ligaments and the breath and the spaces between. It's in the silence at the end of a sentence and a word. It's the echo in the room once we have left it. There is still a part of us, our essence remains. When I think of these artists 
and these artworks, I think of the details. So those are my thoughts on essence. And um, now we're going to explore those thoughts and the details with our artists. Uh, we've arrived at our first artist, who is Bill Sherwood. I'm not sure if we have a visual on Bill, um, so we may just have to hear his voice. Um, I'm going to start with Bill's statement. Um, this is a detail, sorry, incidentally, of uh, one of his two paintings on display called Having a Baby. He's displaying two pieces this month. They are reversed mixed media on plexiglass. And I wanted to read his statement for you. I reverse paint on glass using resins and epoxies, often lighting behind the painting, creating layered effects. What were you thinking when art meets science? So this is where innovation kind of meets classic abstract expressionist gesture and composition. And um, as I always note, there is a wonderful element of drama in all of Bill's artworks. Um, you know, they're very symphonic to me. Uh, the high contrast and colors, it's almost like there's an element of action painting that is part of, of um, you know, his process. Um, but I'm gonna let him tell you about that. Uh, welcome, Bill Sherwood. Bill, are you with us? I'm unmuted, correct? Hey. <laughs> Hi, Bill. Welcome, fellow artists. Um, of course, I know you all and know you all, getting to know everybody uh, well uh, as, as time moves forward here. Um, I wanted to talk about a specific painting. I don't want to be long in the tooth. Uh, but this, this having a baby is a, a 21 year old journey. Um, and it's funny how, you know, we as artists, we often paint for tomorrow, but a lot of it's from the past. There's no question. I mean, I speak to all of you and, and look at your stuff and, and know your, 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 your work uh, as best as I can interpret. And it's, it's all from something, maybe an experience. This is an interesting one. Um, because obviously I'm, I'm a man, I can't have a baby. Uh, I did have one, uh, 21, he's 21 years old today, who Petra and Jason have, have known and, and met for some time now as he's come around the gallery and walked the streets of LA with me uh, from time to time. When I look back at this painting when I was doing it, understand this, um, it's like a script. Uh, and it's the experience of, of that whole concept of, 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 of birth and, and uh, you know, trying to uh, be part of his life, which I wasn't. Um, I wish I could have been, but I chose to, and I don't like to use this word too often, pursue a dream because dreams are here today and they're gone tomorrow. So. Pursuing a dream is not really something that I like to, to, to reference very often, but I did move to LA. I did, you know, uh, pursue painting back in uh, right around when he was born. Uh, I did participate in a lot of his life, uh, in his life events, but it's not the real thing. Um, and this is what came out. Wow, that's that's um, that's really a very very personal and very moving. And thank you so much for um, sharing that. Um, I know I know how much you love Trey, and I know that you were involved always. But uh, I understand that the the physical proximity is is something that is it's a challenge when you can't be there, you know, to witness the the details of life, you know, the report cards, the, the bad games, whatever it is, it's, it's hard, but I know that he felt your love because um, you're a very loving person. And um, this is uh, so personal, so wonderful. Thank you, Bill. 
Thank you so much. Um, I also want to put a shameless plug in. Bill is also our artist in residence, and he has a studio in the back of the gallery. So um, next time you are at the gallery, and um, if you would like to see more of Bill's work, um, after having visited our main presentations, um, we can also always take you up there and share that work with you. Um, and he typically comes around um, during receptions and whatnot. So thank you, Bill, again. Um, and I will move on to Adria Becker. Um, Adria, dear, are you with us? She is. There she is. Hi. Hi. Um, so let me see my next. Uh, so this is a detail from Adria's painting, The Trees Are Melting, number two. Um, Adria is still a relatively new artist to our GDCA family, so um, I'm going to read a little bit of a bio about her so that you can um, get to know her a little better. Um, Adria has served as a past executive director for and on the art panel of Artist Co-op 7, where she teaches right brain figure drawing. She's currently on the board of directors of the San Fernando Valley Arts and Cultural Center. Uh, she is a fellow curator, and in addition to being a full-time artist, she also teaches oil painting at the American Jewish University in Los Angeles. So now... Welcome, I give you Adria Becker. Thank you, Petra. Um, I just wanted to speak a little bit about this particular painting, which is the way I like to use oil paint, which is um, to liquefy them and to pour them. I always have something graphic in mind when I do that. Uh, and so it's not just a, a whoosh of stuff, but I try to move the, the paint in a particular way, but then it does take off and do its own thing. And I like to work with that and see what's happening, what that it inspires in me. And I think, unfortunately, the name of this painting is way too appropriate for what we're all going through. Um, I came up with it the, this uh, a few years ago, but it's just getting more and more accurate. Uh, the trees are melting. Um, but I also think there's a certain beauty in seeing what the different colors are doing with each other in contrast with the, the purple hills. And, you know, we all love nature and I hate to see it going up in flames, but that seems to be a little bit of what's happening. But hopefully there will be some enjoyment in, in looking at this painting and um, seeing them right before they go up. Sorry. <laughs> Well, there certainly is a lot of beauty and, and to behold in this painting and, and specifically the colors are just such a knockout. You know, they really just um, stop, stop you in your tracks. They're so vibrant and there's so much joy in them and it's so unique. I would have never thought of contrasting or, or abutting these colors, but it all works. It's just so splendid. It's so beautiful. Um, Thank you, Petra. Uh, and I am a totally a colorist. And when I do my figure drawings, it's the same thing. I, the, my people are blue and purple and <laughs> orange and, you know, it, it's all, uh, all I am. A, I'm a colorist. Uh, the brighter, the better. I love that. Me. <laughs> Yeah, and I was, uh, I noted that in one of your statement, part of a different part of your statement, you say, I love to paint and draw the figure in a non-traditional way, which is also, I think, what you're referring to in the color choices. Cool. But what it kind of tied into my whole gestalt here of this show was, again, I feel like by treating it in a non-traditional way, you manage to really profile and reveal its essence. You know, it's not what's visible, it's what's felt. So... Thank, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you got that. That's good. <laughs> All right. So thank you, dear Adria. Um, we are now moving on to Suki Kurs. And Suki, unfortunately, can't be here tonight. So I'm going to um, read a little bit, a part of her statements. This particular image um, 
was again one of uh, Jason Busio's signature canted angles that we love. Um, this is part of a, what I created as a triptych. They're actually individual pieces. They're part of the Altar of the Sun series we're about to get into, but I, um, they just really struck me as a fabulous, phenomenal triptych. So that's where that comes from. Um, so Suki is exhibiting uh, two different series, the Altar of the Sun series, one through five, and also two pieces from her Music City series. We're gonna begin with um, the Altar of the Sun series. In this latest exhibition, Suki writes, I have continued my exploration of balance, space, and texture. In this new series, Altar of the Sun, I have created work handmade, sorry, work with handmade and hand dyed sheets of paper. The papers have dictated a shift in my work as I'm using a colorful palette as well as wild bird feathers. The five pieces were created in a very short period of time and are particularly satisfying due to that rapid developmental process. I worked on one piece until it was finished as opposed to working on several pieces at once. Staying with each individual canvas for a specific time was an enlightening and uplifting experience. The sense of completion was exhilarating, as was the need to move on to the next blank canvas. The other two pieces, Music City 1 and 2, complete my portion of the exhibit. Both pieces were created for a one-woman show and share my signature pale palette. Using elements of vintage lace, sheet music, fabric, and dress patterns that weave an abstract cityscape, there is an element of contemplative quietude that reflects the delicate touch of a woman's hand. The urban landscape is softened by that touch. And she really beautifully described all of that and hit so many of the, the detail elements that, that you note when you look at the work. But another thing is I always joke and say that to understand Suki's work fully, you really need a Rosetta Stone. And she needs to kind of create that Rosetta Stone because it's, it's her unique sort of self-created language and symbolism and whatnot. But um, they're certainly harmonized and unified by the feeling that is Suki. Um, and that completes that section and we arrive at our dear Suzanne Belcher. So let me get my notes out. This particular shot is a detail of her mixed media painting. I believe, oh, don't kill me, Suzanne. I believe this might be Eye of the Storm. Is this right? No. No, Journey to Oz. No. No. Then it has to be- Oceans Rising. rising. Oceans Rising. Ding, 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 ding. Oceans Rising for 500, please. Um, sorry. But I wanted to give you an option and introduce <laughs> first here. Um, all three works. So I wanted to read a little bit about your of your beautiful statement. Uh, Eye of the Storm, Mother Earth nurtures all her children and can also punish them when they disobey her. Humankind has become a parasite upon her breast as it takes more than it needs and gives little in return. Oceans Rising and Journey to Oz. The ocean is our cradle, but it now begins to overflow and to wash us away. Her gentle breezes have become unrelenting storms to blow us off the earth. My reverence for Mother Earth, our wildlands and wildlife, along with the growing implications of climate change, informed my work in this exhibition. Let us remember that we are only visitors here and not the masters upon this planet, Earth that we call home. So with that, I'd like to welcome Suzanne Belcher. Hi, Suzanne. Hello. Uh, hi, everyone. I, first of all, thank you, Petra, always. And uh, shout outs to all of my companion artists in the show, such talented and wonderful people. And of course, another shout out to Anthony, uh, who's behind the scenes here. Uh, who's also an incredible photographer and, and artist, and he's our techie. 
and to Jason for his brilliant lighting and exhibit presentation videos and, uh, you know, what a trio actually. Um, the body of work that, <clears throat> excuse me, that you're looking at tonight is certainly a lot different than what you've been seeing from me in the gallery this year, if, you, if you've been tuning in. Um, from my colorful, fun, whimsical cyber serenades, um, of course, always with undertones of traveling uh, during isolation, uh, to the, the muted and extremely abstract canvases uh, with semi-dystopic undertones. These are not new works for me. Um, but part of an extensive series bearing environmental overtones and concerns that face us today and for future generations tomorrow. Uh, it's interesting, you know, being next to Adria's work with her melting trees, uh, because these are all, you know, environmentally overtoned pieces. Um, Oceans Rising, which you, <coughs> excuse me, uh, which you see on the left, and I have the storm in the middle and journey to Oz, perhaps on the winds of that famous Wizard of Oz tornado blowing Dorothy and Toto away, which we're all familiar with. Um, I've always been a save the planet person for as long as I can remember, save the earth. And I despair and I'm saddened by the lack of progress uh, that we seem to be making uh, to do just that, to save our only home. Uh, when I incorporate my shadow image in my work, which you see in both of these pieces here, uh, it's become one of my signatures, uh, particularly in my painting, not so much in my digital photography, but I become both a, a participant and an observer in my work. And I'm observing big time in Oceans Rising and Journey to Oz. Um, like all of my work, I may have an idea of course, in mind when I, I get going, but the work then really takes on a life of its own. And I rarely know how the piece is, is going to end up. So the ground in these pieces, uh, these are big canvases for me. These are probably uh, really some of the largest work I've done. I usually, as collage artist, uh, um, do big for me. Um, I start by laying down a ground um, with or where it's going to take me. Uh, and then I collage into the pieces and I use in these pieces image transfers um, of my own photography usually. Um, transparency film snippets, uh, some of my own regular photographs that I use. Uh, I repeat photographs a lot, uh, particularly in my earlier work. I have, uh, I call them totems or symbols that usually trees or things that I use over and over that become um, memorable if you're, if you're looking at the work. And um, the Eye of the Storm, which is this one, was inspired by the Gulf oil spill, which many of you will remember. And for about a couple of years, um, pretty religiously, when I wasn't as busy as I am now, I watched wild birds nesting online uh, from beginning to end, building their nests, uh, you know, uh, laying their eggs and, and raising their, their young. And you get really attached to them. And I realized that a lot of these birds would, would be migrating south and they would be going to this area to, to mate and to, to nest and to raise their young. And they might never, never come back. Um, so most of this series is, is called Wings of Destiny. Um, so, I mean, that's really about it, except a little aside. Um, two of these three pieces, uh, Oceans Rising and Journey to Oz, were boldly featured uh, along with one more um, other piece called Parallel Dimension uh, in an independent uh, low budget film, um, but it ended up getting international distribution 
and it's called Magnum Opus. Uh, if any of you are on Facebook, you can, you can go on, look for Magnum Opus, the movie, uh, and um, you, know, you can see some of my comments, the um, movie streams on many platforms. It was actually a very well done production it was a little hard to follow at times, but these two pieces uh, were big time shown in a couple of scenes and I was really, really thrilled. Um, and um, I guess it was Sylvia Golden and Karen Hansen who are also artists in, in the, the venue here. Uh, they had work also selected and they were all ended up on the cutting floor. They were so disappointed and I was so excited, but sad for them that they didn't get their work in there. Um, so anyway, other than that, um, thank you again, Petra. I always put in a plug for Gloria Delson Contemporary Arts. Uh, all the work that you see is for sale. It helps support this wonderful venue and it helps uh, keep the the artists excited and, and working uh, as well. So if you see something that you like uh, in the shows tonight, uh, reach out to Petra. She's the greatest and she works so hard for us and we all love her so much. So anyway, have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not letting you go just yet. <laughs> Thank you, honey. Thank you for always being my, my best wing lady. And um, uh, but I wanted to talk also more about this work because again, you know, I kind of fell in love with them the minute I saw them and they really touched me on a very deep level because they're so, what I call tempest tossed, you know, they're so mm -hmm. deeply psychological. They're, they're, to me, they're like dreams, at least that's sometimes what my dreams look like. <laughs> and it is just, you know, there's, there's so much going on, but there's, there's one thing about them is they're still inviting. You know, they're not scary. They're dramatic, for sure. They're emotional, they're intense, but they're, they're not foreboding. They're not frightening. They're engaging you. You still feel safe. You still feel safe to explore this terrain. If I was a psychologist, I would want these in my office because I feel it would kind of create a, a safe uh, introduction and, and, and like a blanket for them to to, to dig deep and to, to open up. It's um, just, I just really love them. I'm so happy that you um, let me show these when I found them on your website. Um, so, well, that's you. interesting because you know that I have a psychology background. So that psychology actually informs a lot of my work. So yeah. <laughs> get it right on. It, it's clear, but, but that's, that's the trick is, you know, sometimes that can also I don't know, it can be so personal that it's, it, it doesn't, or that it, it can be scary or, you know, inviting or not, but you, because I think of the person that you are and because you have so much light in your life and that you communicate, you, you manage to invite us in onto the journey. So anyway, thank you for being you. Thank you for being you. Thanks. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, let's see so that uh, wraps up our Suzanne and brings us to our next artist Linda Stelling so um, unfortunately Linda can't be here with us um, tonight she's got a lot on her plate she's doing so much I'm gonna embarrass her a little bit here but she kind of gave me permission she's also currently pursuing a master's in painting and uh, so tonight was kind of a big night for her where she had to um What's it called? It's not demonstrate. It's uh, defend. You know your your. It's an interesting word, um, but but kind of explain your your work. And um, anyway, this particular piece uh, is a detail from her painting in bloom. And um, I'm going to start off with her statement. Sunlight feeds everything I do. The studio where I work is built like a big tree house overlooking colorful gardens and water features. And from this point of view, I can focus my energy. I strive to bring as much joy and love into the work because I feel this is why we are here on this planet 
to dream love. So as you'll notice, we are exhibiting uh, two different styles, uh, Linda's abstract and poured paintings, as well as some of her florals and floral abstractions. Besides being a wonderful painter, Linda is also a passionate gardener. And naturally, she brings some of this inspiration into her work and her themes that she explores. And in my opinion, she somehow really captures the essence once again, that sort of keeps coming up for me. Um, but additionally, uh, Linda has been adding some new experimental works that fall into what I call um, now, um, uh, someone enlightened me to this, a post-digital hybrid genre. And basically what that means is they derive, in this case, from an original painting, a diptych, and then she took that and uh, has been kind of creating digital variations on theme uh, from that original diptych. Um, so they also, they're quite small and they fall into our small works category, which is also um, always really attractive and a great starting point for young and emerging collectors. So, um, try to have sort of the full gamut of size and uh, range in our exhibits. Um, so now I wanted to read some of the uh, background or some thoughts that she wrote down for the specific painting. I'm going to start with inoculation on the left. Subliminal messages are a thread I like to work into my practice as an artist. I try to incorporate the study of dreams and their symbols which have an effect on our waking lives. And turning to in bloom on the right, I love everything organic and the process of growth and nurture. These elements surface in my memories at every turn. They are a fabric that I love to weave into color and form and then imagine their touch and smell. This piece in bloom is a conversation between the unspoken, perhaps the broken, possibly, but definitely an invitation to meld with a connection to the unexpressed message of love. Um, next, I want to read, um, this is getting into some newer work for, us, for Linda, the very, very abstracted diptych on the right called Original Sin. She writes, Original Sin is created at the fringe of our senses those edges that we all go to in our sleep or awake, those places in our subconscious that allow us to stay and experience what our mind can conjure, good or bad, sensual or sexual, the here or the make-believe. So that is an overview of the um, different styles that Linda has on display this month. And I wish she could be here, but we are wishing her well for her um, big night. And with that, we're moving on to our next artist, who is Michele Castagnetti. So this is a detail of Michele's new painting called Seascape. And um, it's quite a departure from the niche that the artist has kind of carved for himself as what I like to call our social commentary humanist humorist. And if you know Michaela's other work, um, you will understand what I mean by that. But um, when I asked him for a sound bite for this piece to kind of bring our audience into the painting, because it is so different for him, he gave me this wonderful quote uh, by Abe Sugar. It is only through symbols of beauty that our poor spirits can raise themselves from the things temporal to things eternal. Love that. So with that, I'm going to turn you over to Michele Castagnetti. Michele. Hello, everybody. Oh, I'm, I'm on Zoom. So yeah, this piece is, uh, I mean, I don't know what to say about it. It kind of speaks by itself. It was kind of an improvised piece I did in the garden. And um, somehow this sunset um, on the ocean kind of, um, came out or appeared in front of me. And um, it's, um, 
it's kind of like it speaks for itself. I, don't, I really don't know what to say about it more. I use different paints that I had and some are enamels, enamels, I don't know how you pronounce it. And some of it is acrylic. And uh, um, I just like the way um, it came out. And uh, I think it's quite nice. I mean, I don't know. I'll, I'll give it back to you, Petra. <laughs> Uh, no, it's definitely, it's very beautiful, but it's just, you have to understand that that it's it's so different from the other work, you know, and I, of course, through our conversations, I know that there is a very strong spiritual side to you, but you just don't reveal it, you don't wear it on your sleeve, you know, and it's sometimes sort of coded even in your pop social commentary work, but it's in a much more coverted way, but I feel here you're kind of plugging into it directly. You know, you're much less guarded. You're really um, just speaking right to the feeling. And um, I thought that it was wonderful that you brought all of your inner life into this piece. So um, yeah, it's really beautiful. Thank you for, for making it. Thank you for sharing it with us. And um, I hope we get to see more. <laughs> all right, thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody. Um, that, of course, was our Michele, and this brings us to Terry Dryden, and uh, Terry, unfortunately, cannot be here tonight, so I'm going to stand in for her. This is a detail from eight of her, uh, a grid of eight of her artist-painted paper collages on wood. Um, Terry is a mixed media artist who really made her mark in the collage field. Her work is inspired by her studies in Japan, Japanese culture as a whole, and the philosophy of wabi-sabi, which uh, celebrates in a paraphrased way all that is impermanent, imperfect, and incomplete. The need to simplify has become an important factor in my day-to-day -day living. Terry writes, in my latest series, The Solace of Open Spaces, I continue to explore the concept of spaciousness, breathing room, high ceilings, the area between the lines of a poem. It's that place you go to when you become still, quiet, calm. My process of uniting color, shape, line, and texture focuses on finding that place by creating complex surfaces only to cover them and leaving only what is necessary. So this particular series that sort of shines through those lines as well was created during the pandemic. And I know that um, she spoke of the really longing for those open spaces, really struggling with being um, in lockdown and I feel like she, you can sense that in sort of the complex layering of the structures behind the open spaces that she created and the larger uh, painted papers that float above. Um, so anyways, I wish, uh, I wish you were, she were here so you could meet her, but I hope um, that this brings you a little bit into her process and her work and um, there we go, that wraps up Terry Dryden. And brings us to a real live artist who's here in person, Richard Bell. This is of course a, a detailed close up of uh, one of his dry brush portraits, Bob, um, Bob Marley. Um, this series is a continuation of his jazz slash musician portraits series. And I really love these smaller scale dry brush portraits. I feel they really, again, I'm not, forgive me for beating this, this word to death, but I really feel he captures the essence of the performer and the, the, the movement in the, the creative act. Um, Richard writes in a statement, I've always been heavily influenced by music. A chord progression or a lyric connects me to specific moments in my past with great fondness. These are some of the artists who have influenced me most through the years. So with that, I would like to welcome Richard Bell. Richard, Hello. Hi. Yeah, I'm here. All right, Richard, would you, um, 
talk to us a little bit about dry brush uh, for those that aren't familiar with it and and how did you discover dry brush? Okay, so dry brush is just um, using your paint without any kind of medium, you know, to loosen it up. So you're basically just dipping your dry brush into the paint and then applying it to canvas or, you know, whatever you're applying it to. Um, I was introduced to dry brush during a residency at Vermont Studio Center by uh, a fellow um, Chinese artist from New Zealand. Um, we, you know, we always just hung out at each other's studios and he saw some of my work and he was like, have you considered dry brush? And um, I didn't know what it was at the time. And so I followed him to a studio and he showed me these wonderful dragons he had done um, using dry brush. And um, immediately I was fixated and I immediately decided to attempt to do that with the figures, um, with the figure models that I, I was working with. And um, I, I felt like it was um, successful enough. Um, it's still, you know, a work in progress because um, it, it, I'm finding different ways to control the amount of pigment that goes onto the canvas to, you know, make all of the variations and tones and, and whatnot. Sorry, I muted myself, so it took me a second. <laughs> There. Yeah, I was I was wondering about that because I really admire how you're able to create this this subtle degree of shading without any kind of liquefaction. You know, I imagine that must be really difficult to 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 shade that way to to get the expression just right and the the dimensions of the face. Um, because and you also you can't undo it. It seems like. Right, it's not, um, well, I started out um, doing, when I started doing art, I started with charcoal. Um, but this is completely different than charcoal, yes, because there's not much room at all for error. You have to be very deliberate with your brush strokes. And um, so I don't know, it makes it more challenging and, and fun for me. Well, um... Again, I, I was so captivated by these pieces. And, and one of the things I, I was kind of free associating, looking at them. And um, one of the things that occurred to me is that it is the, the, the rawness and the purity of the emotion that, that you capture, especially of performers in the act of, of performing. And um, it seems to me that, that you kind of distill it and you allow us to, to share in their intimacy and the pain of the act of creation. Because it is, it's this, this glorious and excruciating sacrifice of birthing one's soul when you're really giving over to a creative act. And um, you have taken us inside that moment without violating their privacy. You know, I don't know how you do that, but you kind of still made it safe and approachable. And, um, but uh, as, as you also know, like I was in tears when, when you first brought them in and I was looking at Billie Holiday and I don't know what it was. It just really, it just really hit me. So um, anyways, thank you so much for what you do. Thank and you, Portia. I mean, uh, Petra. I, I have Portia on my mind. She's I love Portia. Oh, thank you, honey. She loves you back. She definitely does. Um, so uh, thank you again. And this, whoops, boink. Can't have a reception without the little boinking sound. So there you go. Um, we are leaving Richard Bell now. We are concluding our thoughts on essence only to arrive at the one, the only, the fabulous Cynthia Ann Swan. <laughs> um, this is of course Deja Vu, which um, was extended by popular demand. And I have to hand it to the lady. She's been doing so well in this exhibit that <laughs> she's been selling a lot and we're holding it over for yet another month. <laughs> so, um, you know, you'll be getting familiar with these pieces, but she has augmented 
the exhibits as pieces have sold. So um, I'm going to uh, take you through the installation and read Cindy's statement for those of you who haven't seen it yet. Deja Vu is a limited retrospective of my work created in three of my earlier collections. Autumn Winter, 2012, Black and White, 2013, and Snowflakes, 2013. The work has been curated to share four cohesive characteristics, chronology, palette, presentation, and nostalgic reference. The title intends a double meaning, the literal experience of viewing these pieces with a sense of having seen them before, and the figurative reflection of time and memory as, an emo as emotionally charged moments of repetition. These three collections were created at three different times and embraced three different concepts. Seasonal change, one magical night of the jellical moon, and the celebration of winter beauty contrasted against the threat of its destruction and the melting ice caps. What unites them is that they all represent a strong trigger for my own personal sense of déjà vu, back east winters of childhood, sorry, and of childhood memory. Experts tell us that memory, stress, and fatigue create the perfect storm for déjà vu. No wonder then, we are all part of this surrealistic collective reflection. The world has just passed through a tumultuous year of fear, loss, and sorrow. In the chaos, anger, and isolation, we have found ourselves grasping for bits of normalcy. The before times of memory, before the sickness, before the death, before the disconnection. Have we been here before? Can we go back again? But we cannot go home again. All we have is now. And now what? <laughs> so with that, I would like to welcome and introduce to you Cynthia Ann Swan, modern abstract impressionist. Welcome, Cindy. Thank you, Petra. Well, I have talked a lot about the things that I'm showing in different considerations. And hopefully I'm going to bring some surprises to you tonight that you didn't know yet. So this is First Snow and uh, it's part of my Snowflakes uh, collection. And I will be talking about those later on. What's gonna happen is we're gonna have close-ups being shown of my pieces. And I'm going to read you a little bit behind the scenes of what makes me do what I do. <clears throat> My primary visual art medium is kiln form glass, which is glass that is shaped by heat using the kiln. I consider myself to be a modern abstract impressionist. Modern because I'm always pushing the limits of glass, forging new processes and techniques crossing art boundaries by incorporating materials and tools used in other industries and creative applications and adapting them for inclusions with my glass. Abstract, because in most of my work, I start with the concept that is personal for me, art should originate in your own soul, and strive to find the essence of the idea or subject I am depicting then push through what I call a universalizing filter, removing the subjective elements unique to me. What's left is the purity of the idea, free of prejudice and ready to be recolored by the viewer's personal palette of experience. Finally, <clears throat> impressionist because above all, my art is infused with the feeling of the moment, the part of the perception that remains in the heart and the memory long after the moment has passed. If I could choose only one word to encompass what I hope my art conveys, it would have to be peace. 
My art celebrates nature and the beauty that is always around us, but often overshadowed by the challenges and stress of our daily lives. Many artists find their niche in taking on social ju justice, anger, and empowerment. I do not feel called to that purpose, though I totally support the arts that are. We need their voices to bring issues to attention. Instead, I hope my art can provide a moment of respite in the fight, in the storm, if only for a brief moment, a blanket of light. <clears throat> So the Snowflakes Collection, um, as Petra mentioned, it is basically celebrating all that is winter, but I have surfaced the presentation panels that you see behind them in the, in the variegated grays. That is based on aerial photography of the melting ice caps. So that stands as a caveat that as beautiful as winter is, we're not gonna have it if we don't address global warming and the seasons may not be here anymore. So on the, on the left, you see Windy Blues and you see Cool Jazz and they're both pieces from my nightclub series. And the idea with this was they were trees that are dancing in the dark to their own music as the wind blows through them and when nobody's looking. And so the windy blues is more of an active blues and cool jazz on the side is, is a more of a gentle breeze. Um, I've depicted the, the instruments in this case in sort of linear fashion, more specifically in cool jazz, which to my way of thinking looks a little bit like clarinets. Next. <clears throat> Snows of Lothlorien. This is a triptych, although any of these could stand alone, but they really work best together. I did a lot of research on Tolkien. He is the author of Lord of the Rings, and he created a mythology, a historic mythology, before he ever wrote his books. And if you're really interested in the connectivity of the of the different books and or movies, then you really should start with his, his mythology and you'll get a, a behind the scenes of what made the elves, what they are, et cetera. So these are the, the trees in the forest of Lothlorien, which is uh, an elven forest. And um, the only trees that grow there are Malorn trees and they don't grow anywhere else. And so this, is a night in, in the winter forest of Lothlorien. Um, and it's known as the silver forest because all the leaves in Lothlorien are silver. Uh, these, these pieces took a lot of time and many, many fires. And it was difficult because I hate repeating things. If you know me, you'll know I just don't like to repeat things. But for, to pull this particular series off, I kind of had to do it. And so I made all of the components separately and to make them as close as possible, I had to do them in, in a linear fashion. So all the corner pieces were done together and all this and all that. And then I put them all back together again and uh, fired them one last time to get the texture on the top. Um, these are also interesting because they have embedded in them many sheets of 24 karat gold. And on the surface, if you saw these in, in person, you would see they, they have little drops of silverness on the surface. And that's actually um, palladium, which at the moment is more twice as expensive as gold. Um, and there's just little hints of that. And uh, I, I think it's a quiet series, but it's a nice series. Next. Okay, these are two pieces that are in the Winter Ludes series in Snowflakes. The one on the left is Night and Day on Ice. And that is kind of like a positive and negative view of the same moment in time. So the, 
the part on the on the left would be the stream, which is an abstraction of what this is. Um, this is a winter stream that has um, ice flows going on and the linear pieces of white glass are sort of as flow. And it has one look at night. And then in the daytime, which would be the right side of it, when the, the sun is, is bouncing off the little ice crystals, um, it has a much more um, sparkling nature. The one on the right, that is one of my favorites, it's guardians. Those are also trees. I do a lot of trees. I love forests, I love trees. <laughs> and those are, are trees that were made by aluminum inclusion. So I used uh, strips of aluminum. Aluminum has a fairly low melting point for a metal, um, much lower than copper. I do a lot of copper inclusions, but this time I wanted the, the metal to partially dissolve. And that's exactly what happens at, at a, a fusing temperature in glass. Aluminum, if it's thin enough, will pretty much just disappear into a bunch of bubbles. But if it has some thickness to it, and this was um, a heavy duty aluminum foil like you would use for your, your turkey at Thanksgiving. Um, so it had a little bit of weight to it and it started to um, disintegrate, but it left sort of this ghosting images of the trees and their guardians as in sentinels. I, I see the trees as sort of caretakers of the earth. Um, they certainly are, are important in terms of the atmosphere and providing oxygen. And so they have a very quiet job. They're often not even recognized, but they're stoically guarding for the rest of us. Next. First snow, that's on the left-hand side. And I am very proud to say that another one of the artists in the show decided to adopt first snow. First snow um, is an abstract. If you saw it in person, you would see there's very subtle coloration, um, the bottom being white and it, it sort of fades into a very light blue. Back East skies are never bright blue, never ever, not even in the summer. Um, there's so much atmospheric mist, moisture, that everything is sort of washed out. And the winter is really washed out. You have an overcast, nature that is, it's depressing to a lot of people. I happen to find it restful and I miss that. I miss that here. So those are trees and um, they're supposed to be birch trees. And the, the forest has some depth, depth to it because if you look deeper into the piece, you'll see uh, little twigs of trees in the distance. Uh, again, all of these are connected. You can tell the ones in the Snowflake series because of their presentation panels. My husband and I both do the presentation panels. I design them, he physically builds them, and then I do the decorative um, application on the front. And um, I consider the presentations to be equal to the glass. Uh, they, they aren't just something that holds the glass on the wall. Um, I, I, I think that they have to be married to the glass. And so they're very important. The collection I'm working on right now, the glass is finished, but now we've moved into doing the presentations and that's going to take at least a month or two, almost as long as it took me to make the glass. Okay, on the right-hand side is right of spring. And um, that is basically when the, the ice starts to crack and, and break on top of the the river in, in the springtime and starts to break off into chunks and make ice, uh, um, ice flows. And I just love the texture of this piece. Um, it actually has physically where those cracks are, you can, it has the tactile quality that you can actually feel all of those ridges. Next. All right, the black and white collection. In some ways, my most difficult collection because I love color. I absolutely love color. And in this particular collection, I forced myself to have a very limited palette, just a, a shades of gray, uh, a gray gradation of, of black and white. And that forced me to 
emote um, using only contrast and texture and uh, took color out of the mix. And in order to pull it off, I had to really concentrate on controlling what the kiln was gonna add to the glass. I, I, I construct my pieces cold and um, in layers. Sometimes the layers are done independently and then added back together, but my work is always cold. And then I put it in the kiln and I program the kilns to do what I think they should do. And sometimes they surprise me, <laughs> but it, this, this particular collection really, really required me to be very technically um, in the game because I had to control the, the rate of heating and cooling, how high it went, how long it sat there, all of that. Because if you just, let it all melt together. It, it's just a, a very smooth surface and that's nice, but doesn't have, in my way of thinking, the same kind of interest that if you have nooks and crannies and, and textures and the shadows kind of come into play and, and, and the shadows change as the light in, in, in the room changes. And I just think that I do a lot of contour fusing and that, that's what it's called when you don't take it to a full fuse a flat, shiny uh, surface. I just find that was really interesting. So <laughs> the two cow ones are in the virtual cow series. There was another one, there was a white one. But what is here is black cow eating licorice in the dark and black and white cow eating Oreos in the fog. The third member was white cow eating marshmallows in the snow. And um, that one got adopted several years ago. The, the joke here is that there is actually a cow in these. Uh, I, I got a, a stamp that had a cow jumping over the moon and um, I used the same color glass as a powder and stamped it into the piece. So while you can see it, it's not evident at, at first glance. And so it's, it's sort of a where's Waldo kind of exploration. <laughs> that you get to uh, encounter. The one all the way over to the right, <clears throat> that's kind of the pivotal piece that kind of anchors the entire black and white collection as far as the story. I try very hard to have my collections have a story to them. And this one's story, the black and white is that all of these images have something to do with a specific night of the year, the night of the Jellicle Moon. If you've ever um, seen the musical Cats, you'll know that on the night of the Jellicle Moon, um, this, this cat king basically comes down and he, he goes over all the activities of all the cats and decides which one is worthy of having eternal life. And this is the Jellicle Cat. This is the cat that's chosen and uh, it's abstracted. Um, to help you out, the little angled white piece on the front, that's one of his legs. So the front, front legs are on the ice and the back legs are not. And, and she's looking at her reflection. And if you saw it in person, you'd actually see some little whiskers and, and ears, you know, just little dishes and dashes here and there. And of course she's covered with snow because it's in the winter. But um, she is the, the bedraggled cat who has made many mistakes in her life but owns her mistakes and doesn't blame anybody else for them. And because of that, she is the chosen one. So all the other pieces happen on the same night, uh, things that are supposed to be happening on this night. So, okay, next. Okay, this is also black and white collection. This is the Diamonds in the Dark series. These are landscapes, more fully um, giving reality to this Jellicle Moon Night. The one on the left, Silver Fork, is an aerial view of a frozen river with an island at the top. If you sort of see that black V, that's where the river splits um, into two sections around the island. And that is the fork and it's silver because all of the, the ice and stuff is all silver in the moonlight. So that's the silver fork. 
The middle one was adopted. It's my personal favorite um, of this entire collection. And one of my favorites from all the work I've ever made. It's also the one that is probably the most difficult. But um, this is the forest. It has a feeling of like Robert Frost's poem of stopping by the woods on a snowy evening. It's a quiet forest. It's not a scary forest, although it is very deep. Um, several, several panels of glass, about six layers, I think, deep. And uh, as you look deeper and deeper into that section in the middle, you'll, you'll start seeing kind of the ghosty figures of the other trees. And then around that uh, centerpiece is um, what I call frit ice, but it's basically like frosty ice that's frozen. And that is framed by black glass that I, I really control the temperature so that the linear nature of it sort of echoes the linear nature of the trees. And then that flows to the presentation panel. Um, and that those little stripes are also supposed to be like the trees, but that was created with acid etched um, by dripping it down. And then I, I selectively removed some of it. So you have a sense of kind of like birch trees um, in that. So that's Nightwood. And then the one that probably captures the, uh, the essence of, the, of that night, the magical night, is this last one. It's Mystical Intersections and um, it's a landscape. I see this as a, a white frozen lake with a little bit of the shore in the background, the trees in the front, but all that crisscrossing going on, the, those are those mis mystical intersections that, that are, are colliding to make the Jellicle Moon Night happen. Next, Black Ice series. Actually, it's a triptych. Okay, so I did the, fit, the middle part first. This is the afterlife of leaves. And the idea is when leaves fall and they, they start off colorful and then they go brown and then they're sort of disintegrated into kind of a slushy um, fossil of what they used to be. And if they land um, close to when the cold snap happens, they might freeze. And that's like the leaves all the way over on the right-hand side. So it's just the leaves. Again, I love trees. And then on the left-hand side, that's winterberry white. And that is um, also done with a contour fuse. It's very, these are all very much tactile images that invite you to touch them. And um, I let you. It's okay to touch them. And then on the side over here, the way I did the, the frit in the top, the way it, it came out, I see an eagle there. And so that's why I, I named it the way I did. So this is the Black Ice series. Black Ice Back East is when it, it, it freezes really quickly and the water that was on the road uh, freezes, but you don't see it because the road is black. And it can be very treacherous. So that's what black ice is. <laughs> Next. Okay, autumn winter collection. This was my second collection. And for me, it was a situation of transition between the, the brilliance of fall color, again, back east, into the, the barren stark contrast of winter and that transitional period in between where things sort of start to disintegrate, change color, go very neutral until a blanket of snow comes and covers all that up and then you have something else. So these three pieces, um, they are representative of floating ice. It, it could be from an iceberg, but it could also be in your, your river or your stream. Um, they're all named for the condition of water, aqueous, translucent, deliquescent. Um, Petra actually named that third one for me. And, and if you look them up, they all really have a lot to say about the nature of water. But I'm really interested in water that freezes because it's very similar to what happens with glass. You may not know it, but glass is a liquid, a very, very slow moving liquid. And when you heat it up, it flows, it runs faster. 
And when it is at room temperature, it is like frozen ice. It it's, doesn't appear to be moving, but um, they're, they're both transparent. They both uh, reflect and transmit light. There's just a lot of similarities between glass and ice. And so I saw these as representing the, the nature of, of water when it goes through that transitional period and then floats on top of the, of the river or whatever as it goes along. Next. Next, thank you. All right, that this is Elvin Wood Triptych, again, going back to Tolkien. Um, I took his mythology a little bit further. This represents an abstraction of a slice of the Malorn tree. So you can see like a cross section of the tree and look into its heart. Now, Tolkien, um, as I told you, he had Lothlorien be the, the forest of the elves. And I have done a lot of research and I realized that uh, elves apparently travel in their dreams, which is why the centerpiece is called dream travel. And they do all of their activity at night. So it's elven nocturne. And the one all the way over on the right hand side, the reason that's called crystal source is I pushed the mythology a little bit further and I decided that the source of their magic was actually these embers that were cradled inside the heart of the tree. And so the, the, the glowing part you see there, which is actually dichroic glass, um, that represents the crystal source of the elfin magic and the elfin imagery. Next. This is also the forest of Lothlorien. Um, I like this forest, what can I tell you? Okay, so <laughs> um, in snows, you saw the typical of what people think of, of Lothlorien. If they think about it at all, they may never have seen Lord of the Rings, so they have no idea what I'm talking about. But if they did, they think of it like a silver forest. But what they don't know is during that transition period, the forest goes gold. So this is golden wood. It's the autumn winter transition of the Lothlorien forest. And I really like this series, this triptych, because I did it with window glass that had been thrown out. It was just window glass. Nobody cared about it. It was broken. Um, I cut it. I, I arranged it. And then I applied 24 karat gold to all of the surfacing that you see shining there. And then I did the same thing to the panel, the presentation panel, that's all 24 karat gold, except for the green stripes, which is um, copper sulfate having been dripped down the presentation panels to react with the copper underneath. Um, this was also adopted. I'm, I'm feeling very, very, uh, I'm feeling the love lately. <laughs> Okay, next. This is an autonomous panel. That's just fancy to say that it was never ever part of a collection. I usually work in terms of a collection, which is the big idea, and then the series which branch off of that and sort of fill in the big idea and the pieces within the series that play well together. They express the idea of the series, but they all ultimately have to answer back to the big idea. Yeah, this one doesn't have one. <laughs> this was actually designed for uh, an auction um, where the theme was um, Gatsby and Art Deco and all that. And so I, I prepared this piece after doing a lot of research. I, I research everything. Um, and so I, I dove deep into patterns and, and Gatsby and, and the, the whole story around the Gatsby kind of thing. And um, I decided to do this, the, the gold is gold again, um, and it's silver mica, but it is 24 karat gold. There's dichro on here, which is uh, a glass that refracts light differently, depending on whether you're, you're transmitting or um, reflecting through it, it changes its color. And I mounted this to an actual canvas, 
And with acrylic paint, I ex extended the linear patterning of the piece uh, so it flows into the panel and sort of does a self-framing thing. And I I decided that this was the great Gatsby era when it started to all fall apart. Uh, the opulence and all that decadence sort of caught up with them. And so this is the after party uh, where things are sort of starting to blow apart, but um, there's, there's still, you know, it's still pretty, so. <laughs> and uh, that's it, I think. Um, I hope I tried to give you new information this time. And, uh, you know, if you ever have any questions or if you're in the gallery, um, Petra knows that I do allow people to touch them because they really, really like it when you touch them, you know, then, and, and so I, I let that happen. And again, I thank Petra and Jason and, um, your gallery just does so much for so many people and you are one of the most honest and caring people per person I have ever met. So thank you for that. Thank you, thank you honey. And, and um, thank you again. This, this show is amazing. And um, I could just, you know, I just love all the details. I just love all these, this is you are, you are alchemist, you are a scientist, you are artist, you are visionary, you are all these things rolled in one and um, I always learn so much. And uh, I'd like how you make the impossible possible. I like how you combine recycled window glass with 23 karat gold, you know, it's like, it's, it's all, we choose what has value. We lift people, we lift things, we lift situations, we lift relationships up to what they are or what they can be. I think that is um, the, 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 one of the many purposes and duties of art. I feel like your work so eloquently demonstrates that physically as well. Um, so thank you, my dear. And I want to lastly give you a plug also. I always forget to do this. So Cindy, if you're intrigued by glass, Cindy teaches master classes. Cindy's actually set up out in, she, they live in Quartz Hill, she and her wonderful husband, John. And she's set up to teach a master class over a weekend, complete with a, an Airbnb set. Whoops, can you hear me okay? Yep. Um, which has separate airflow. If you're still, you know, if you're cautious about COVID, et cetera, it's your own separate airflow, but you can book it with friends, with family, and, and you can study with her and learn about the medium of art if you're an artist or if you're not an artist and you just like to learn. Um, look her up, take advantage of this. It's really rare that an artist is able to, you know, has this kind of a setup. And um, as you can tell, she's also a gifted teacher. Um, don't miss out, don't miss out. Um, well, this, oops, boinking sound, concludes our slideshow presentation of Essence and Deja Vu. So uh, please join us now for a Q&A with the artists. Um, I am going to stop the screen share and look up to see if we have any questions. So there we go. Um, chat. Okay. Uh, it looks like we have a, a comment from Lucy Hinden, Suzanne Belcher, timely and beautiful. <laughs> Suzanne Belcher, um, oh, how lovely, to all panelists um, saying, Cynthia, your work is so extraordinary. Your research, your passion revealed in creating your pieces, plus the presentation of your completed work is awe inspiring. Agreed. Uh, here's a question, I believe it might be from, from Suzanne. Adria, could you share a little bit about the classes you are teaching now and where they are held? Adria, are you there? Did we lose Adria? Okay, well, we'll get back to that. If maybe she's just taking a quick break. Um, Michele, could you share a little bit more about the spontaneity 
experience creating your diptych? Um, I don't know. I mean, it's just, uh, <laughs> you know, if I could uh, talk about it, I'd be a writer, you know, and not a painter. So it's, uh, I think you express a lot of things with, uh, uh, you know, with, with the colors and the brush. And sometimes uh, if you're not inspired, all you have to do is bring a couple of campuses, canvases in your backyard and just start throwing some some paints on them and see what comes out of it. You know, something could be good, something could be bad. If it's bad, you keep working on it until something good comes out of it. So I guess that's that's what I could say about it. You know, this this kind of in this specific painting, I guess it came out nice. Uh, I guess I got lucky on on, on this one sometimes because uh, these were kind of fur. They were like the only strokes that appeared on it. They were just like a one kind of shot, while some other pieces are put them in the back. Um, kind of this kind of series and uh, sometimes I do stuff that I really don't like and I keep working at it until I get something that uh, is completely different from where I started. So I guess that's uh, kind of this specific process. My other pieces are all kind of conceptual. So they kind of have more of an idea and they're more constructed and they're, they're, they're more thought out. But this one is, is, is is, is, is more an expression of the moment, really. And um, sometimes it works. Back to you, Petra. <laughs> um, thank you, that was, that was very illuminating, see? <laughs> thought you had nothing to say. Um, I guess I have a question to all of the artists, which is, um, Leaning into the idea of essence, if you could describe your work with the only one word, what would that be? I would say creative, and uh, that would be easy. <laughs> That's a good one, and it's it's a. Uh. Not this is, however, is, I know this is this is probably putting you on the guys on the spot, but I'm asking all of you. So this wasn't just a question to me. This is a question to all of the artists. If you, and, and again, you know, Jason likes to phrase, take the pressure off a little bit by phrasing it, saying like, okay, you have 10, but just choose one of them, one random out of the 10. So it's not so, the onus isn't so extraordinary on this is the one word. Um, Maybe uh, express. Sorry, I'll say it again. Um, I would, I would think expressive, maybe. Love it, expressive. No kidding. For the body have... work that I have is, I would call it passionate. Mm. Love it. Love it, Cindy. Connected. Connected. Wonderful. Um, and I believe, you know what? I believe. This is all the artists we currently have present, so I can't, I can't channel the others out <laughs> in the air. Um, um, if I'm gonna, cha I'm gonna, I wonder if I were to intuit into Suki's work, whether there would be an element of adventure. Do you think, Delta Sudan, knowing Suki as you do, do you think adventure? Mm -hmm. Adventure, feminine? Feminine, exactly. So, sorry, I'm going to have to mute my microphone. So what I do when I do these presentations, <laughs> I have all these pages of script, right? And when I'm done with it, I drop it to my left. I go, oh, no, no, no. And then what Portia likes to do, as you all know, is she likes to shred paper. So <laughs> she's now shredding my entire spot. <laughs> those are the pages that we've already covered. <laughs> So be it. Go ahead, baby. Well, you've become a collage artist. <laughs> I think she is. <laughs> so go ahead, baby. I'm sorry I had to stop you. But if you hear strange noises, um, that's what's going on. Art. Art is happening to my left. <laughs> um, okay. If, it, you know, the, the another thing that's striking me about all of the sort of connecting tissue is 
There's such a consciousness uh, brought towards environment. I saw that in Suzanne's work and in your words, in, in Cindy's, in um, Adria's. It, it's, it's, um, it's clearly something that we're all having to take more and more seriously. And um, it's, it's apparent, it's everywhere you look. Like you can't avoid it anymore. You know, it's, it's, it's in our art, it's, it's important. Um, but that just kind of struck me that that was a, another red thread that revealed itself during the reception. I didn't even realize that ahead of time. Um, I'm trying to think if we have any other questions. Um, I don't see any. Do you guys have any questions for each other? I, I'd like to, to um, ask Richard a couple of things. Um, at the reception, I had, had asked you, I mean, you're so connected to music and these uh, amazing, iconic uh, musicians that, that you're, you're so connected to. Uh, and I asked you if you were a musician. And you said you're a pianist, um, and um, I'd just like to hear hear more about your background. I just think your work is so wonderful. Yeah, um, yeah. I started um, actually playing piano when I was three. Um, I used to have this thing where I used to listen to the radio all the time, and my parents bought a piano, and so I used to just play by ear. Um, I had lessons, you know, formally, but I could never learn to sight read. So I'd have to trick my teacher into playing the song and then remember it and practice it. And then, um, so, you know, I'd be playing jazz and I played for a lot of churches and church groups. And um, um, yeah, I found out later in life, though, the reason I couldn't read sight read music was because I'm dyslexic. So, oh. the notes on the lines that's just like no non-starter for me but um i was able to write music i just couldn't read it but um but then you know uh i started painting in college and i think i like painting better well you're doing a good job of it thank you that's so fascinating that you could write music but you couldn't read. Oh, okay. That's that there's there's something incredibly um, poetic about that. You have to kind of spend some time with that idea. You know, you can create something, but you can't necessarily observe it. Like you can't stand back and analyze it, but you can. Uh, there's something there. I'm gonna... Honestly, it's very frustrating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My, it's my one of my sons is dyslexic too. So, yeah. Uh, and Cynthia, I have a, you know, I've asked you this before. I, I love the presentation of your work. And, you know, you shared that John, your husband, does all of your presentation panels. And, and they're, they're so wonderful. I mean, it's, um, he, he really does a good job of it. He does. Yeah, I'm very, very lucky. Um, I consider that John and I are really a team. We're partners. And um, he, doesn't, he doesn't like to be in the spotlight himself, but he, he really likes being in the spotlight for me. And I don't like being in the spotlight for me. So we, we sort of complement each other pretty well that way. And um, you know, I, I very much appreciate what he, he does for me in many ways. And the presentations are, they're just critical, I think. Um, you know, you know where that came from? Could Suzanne? you describe what they're, I mean, because you can't see on, on the, the virtual presentations here, you can't, you can't see them. And okay. uh, how much work is involved in, you know, installing these, uh, these glass pieces on aluminum or whatever he uses, there it's just great. Can you we describe use, that? Sure. We used to use um, steel, um, but steel is heavy, 
And also if someone is gonna put the piece outside or like on a patio or whatever, and there's moisture, um, steel will rust. Mm -hmm. And so we have since moved to doing the metal being aluminum. But what happens is, and, and you can see that the evolution, if you look at all the pieces in the gallery right now, and, and just so you know, the autumn winter was the second collection and snowflakes was the fifth one. So you can sort of see how, how we've been changing a little bit, but basically there is some sort of framework um, that's changed over the years. What we're doing right now is the, the surface, the metal surface is, um, is aluminum. And then he takes angle and he attaches it to the back of the panels, um, both for, for a place to able to mount the hardware and also to push it off from the wall. And the way he connects the piece, the glass piece to the frame can, sometimes he has hooks that come in that you can slide the glass onto. Um, the European mount, um, which is just starting to be used here, is like a round mount and it has like about a half inch channel. And so that gives room for irregularly, um, irregular thickness of glass. Gatsby. Yeah, Gatsby has that on it. Uh, the Gatsby piece has those round European mounts. So basically the, the style of the presentations is specifically um, anchored in the essence of that particular collection. Um, but the simple answer is all of those presentations are, are a way of, I wanna say framing, but I don't mean it in the traditional way of framing. I think the presentation panels not only lift up the art and attach it somehow to a wall or whatever, but I also think that what they do is they block out the surroundings and give you a quiet space around the piece to let you then focus on the piece in the middle. When you just take the glass and you stick it on a wall, it's like there's a lot of stuff going on around it. And, and I, I like to sort of have the, the panel be just a little pause in, in the surroundings and, and you can focus more on the art. I, think, that you know, I, I just really would encourage any of the audience that, that may be here to, you know, you can't, you can see the art. I, I love these Zoom presentations, but I encourage now that we can go into the gallery to go and really look at the work because like Bill Sherwood's work, I mean, you, you, you can see how extraordinary it is. Uh, but, uh, you know, how, how he does it. And he may even be there to talk to you about it. So anyway, just another plug. <laughs> well, thank you. And thank you guys, all of you. Um, I don't believe we have any more questions. So um, I think we'll wrap it up. With some okay. I just wanted to, again, thank Night, you. night everyone. And thank you, Petra. Nice and thank you, all. Petra, for all the artwork and all the yeah. patience. Of course, thank you, you guys, and thank you for all of these wonderful examinations of medicine and the details that are you as people and artists. And um, of course, I want to thank our wonderful webmaster, the man behind the curtain, Anthony Caldwell, mm -hmm. for being so generous and patient and hosting us again. And last but not least, of course, a huge thank you to Jason Lucio for the amazing images, with, literally without which I could not create yeah. this presentation and we um, are able to share all of the wonderful artworks with our audience. Um, final thank you to you. Um, thank you. Namaste. You're with us. Blessings to you all. Be good to yourselves. Be good to each other until we see each other again. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye.